Hi, this is Trevor Evans, and this is a presentation I gave as part of TRI's evening seminar series in April of 2017. And as you can see, it's entitled The Perplexing Topic of Hair Type. Clearly, many people have a very intimate and personal relationship with their hair. When we first meet or encounter somebody, it's likely the hair that's one of the first things we'll notice about them. Our choice of hairstyle helps say something about who we are. It's a reflection of our personality. And so when a hair looks good, we tend to feel good, as we know it's helping us to look our best. Conversely, if a hair is unruly, disheveled, and generally not in its best shape, then we might, have feel, we might feel somewhat self-conscious, as we know that we don't look at best. And so bad hair days can go beyond simple visual appearance and can create a very real emotional response. And of course, this represents the origin of what is now an approximate $75 billion global hair care industry. And clearly, there's considerable diversity in hair from the heads of different individuals, which in combination with this desire for a variety of styles and looks leads to a virtually infinite number of daily hair care habits and practices, and uh, also possibly a wide variety of hair related trials and tribulations. So it's not surprising that people perceive their hair and their hair care needs as being very specific to them. And a marketing message that speaks to a given brand or a given line of a brand or even a specific product has been specially designed for your hair and your hair needs clearly represents a very attractive marketing proposition. Although it also begs the question, how do we classify hair? This begins with consumer language, which is the language of our industry, where it's common to hear descriptors such as dry, oily, fine, limp, coarse, damaged, frizzy, and, and many others. Yeah. As hair scientists, we recognize that consumer language is often rather nebulous, where commonly there's no real scientific equivalent or descriptor to the words that consumers use. And very often the same word might mean different things to different people. Similarly, we know that these consumer descriptors can also be somewhat spurious, where we know that often self-diagnoses do not equate to the true technical issues at hand. By means of illustration, we know technically that what consumers call dry hair is in no way desiccated or depleted in water in any way, shape or form. And so we desire a more technical means of looking at the area of hair type. And this is going to be the topic of this presentation. Technically, how different is hair from the heads of different individuals? Is it all the same stuff that's essentially extruded out onto the scalp in different shapes, sizes and colours? Or are there indeed more significant and tangible differences present? In order to address this question, it's first necessary to provide a brief overview of hair's really amazing technical makeup. At the simplest level, we divide hair structure into three basic components, the medulla, the cortex, and the cuticle. The medulla is generally considered equivalent to hollow space running through the very center of the hair fiber, and it's usually paid little attention. It's worth recalling that likely the primordial reason for mammals evolving hair and fur is, is to keep them warm, and so a hollow medulla helps aid the insulating efficiency. The very outer portion of the hair is termed the cuticle and consists of overlapping plates, tile-like structures that act as a hard resistant protective layer. An analogy is often drawn to the tiles on the roof of a house, which similarly serve to protect a more vulnerable interior. And finally, the bulk of this interior structure is termed the cortex. But I think you can see the cortex also has considerable additional substructure. The figure on the right shows another simplistic top line overview where we can see cortical cells, sometimes termed macrofibrils, embedded in a lipid like cell membrane complex. Moreover, these cortical cells have further substructure where these macrofibrils are themselves composed of even smaller microfibrils, together with other proteinaceous components. The cuticle too contains considerable substructure where each of these individual tile-like structures has a laminate makeup consisting of more heavily cross-linked components nearer the surface. The picture on the upper right shows how multiple cuticle layers are also present such that erosion or removal of any of these layers still has a backup layer, so to speak, down below. So undoubtedly hair fibers have a bewilderingly complex biocomposite structure, which is what gives rise to its strength and durability. And yet there's little evidence in the scientific literature to suggest that these structural components differ in any way as a function of so-called hair type. I've heard it said that the number of cuticle layers present in hair from different ethnicities can change. Uh, I'd like to think that I've followed the hair literature pretty closely for about the last 25 years, but I've never once seen data or any scientific paper or, or even a reference in support of this belief. 
I'm fortunate in that my job allows me to regularly interact with many other active researchers in the hair field. And in polling this network, I encountered a similar story where, yes, people indeed have heard this same belief, but they too have not seen any data or references. And as such, this idea, I think, has to be taken with a sizable grain of salt and likely takes its place in the unfortunately quite long list of unsubstantiated industry folklore. If there is an exception to the statement made on a previous slide about hair structure and hair type, then it's the presence or absence of a medulla in hair of different dimensions. Thick hair tends to have a very pronounced medulla, as shown by the optical microscopy image on the left of this slide. However, the medulla is often discontinuous or even absent in fine hair, as shown by the images on the right. Yet with this said, this difference clearly doesn't make thick and thin hair vastly different entities. They are still made up of the same stuff and all the same substructures just described. They simply just differ in the presence or absence of a medulla. Clearly, there's considerable difference in the shape of hair from the heads of different individuals, where hair might be straight, very curly, or anywhere in between. And perhaps on the surface, this might imply that structural differences are present. Yet, it's most commonly believed that the shape of hair is dictated by the hair follicle. In the lower half of this slide, I'm showing pictures that come from a paper by researchers at L'Oreal in Paris, where they biopsied the scalp of different individuals and then sectioned the sample such that we can actually see the hair fibers inside the follicle. And it can be seen that on the left, curly hair fibers are emerging from curved follicles, while on the right, straight hair is actually emerging from straight follicles. Moreover, if we look at the bulb at the very base of the follicle, it can be seen that straight hair is growing from a symmetrical bulb, while curly hair grows from an unsymmetrical bulb. And so these researchers concluded, as the title of the paper appropriately puts it, that hair shape is programmed from the bulb. And so, again, despite appearing very different, curly hair and straight hair appear to essentially be made of the same stuff that is shaped differently during growth in the follicle. Colour is another very distinguishing property of hair, and we know that this colour comes from the presence of menylene pigment granules that are located within inside the cortical region. There's two different types of menylene in hair, eumenylene and pheomenylene. And relatively low levels of menylene lead to lightly pigmented or blonde hair, while progressively higher levels lead to darker coloration. Hair from the heads of some individuals of northwestern European descent can contain high levels of pheomenylene, and that's what creates red coloration. And of course, any lack of pigmentation results in the presence of gray hair. With this said, menylene levels and even the darkest hair are still relatively low. And so once again, despite strikingly different visual properties, it certainly appears that differently colored hair is not a completely different beast. So this seems to lead to a rather anticlimactic conclusion that technically, well, hair is hair is hair. It all seems to essentially be the same stuff that comes in different shapes, sizes, and colors. Yet, it's worth contemplating how these seemingly mundane properties can nonetheless have a profound impact on hair properties and subsequent issues. Historical papers in the scientific literature that have focused on characterization and classification of hair have generally been based around ethnicity. This approach has been criticized by some in these modern times, but it can be seen why this approach was employed in that clearly there are considerable differences in the appearance and properties of for example, Asian, Caucasian, and African hair. Yet, there's little evidence to suggest any fundamental differences outside of size, shape, and color. To illustrate, Asian hair is generally heavily pigmented. It's often straight in conformation. It's rather thick in diameter, and if viewed in cross-section, it's essentially spherical in shape. Caucasian hair, by contrast, is quite variable in pigmentation, ranging from blonde to dark. It's variable in shape, ranging from straight to curly, and is finer in diameter, and in cross-sectional area, it's distinctly elliptical. Finally, African hair is also generally heavily pigmented. Its defining feature is its highly kinky and curly shape, and it can come with considerable variability in thickness. Uh, it's also highly elliptical, sometimes almost ribbon-like in cross-sectional area. And so size, shape, and color can hugely impact the visual appearance of the hair. But they control other properties also. Thick hair obviously possesses more weight, which impacts the way that it hangs from the head and also the manner by which it moves. Increasing levels of curvature will create additional contact points between adjacent fibers, which will also impact the way that it hangs from the head and the way it moves. 
In more extreme cases, this lack of alignment may create manageability issues where the number of hairstyles available to the wearer becomes restricted and grooming can also become a problem. African hair represents an especially extreme representation of this occurrence, which necessitates quite different habits and practices. One major issue involves the fragility of this hair type, where breakage is commonly listed as a top concern. This again might imply some sort of different structural makeup, but alternate explanations can be theorized. A material will always break at its weakest point, and it's been suggested that the highly kinky conformation of African hair leads to points of highly concentrated stress along fibers, which can produce structural flaws. With this said, I suspect a highly elliptical cross-sectional shape to be a contributor. During grooming, fibers must bend and twist to slide past each other, but the highly elliptical shape of fibers means restricted mobility. Clearly, a considerable bending differential will exist about the major and minor axes of this highly elliptical hair fiber. And so during manipulation, we would expect sizable internal stresses to arise in fibers, which I suspect could be the harbingers of these structural flaws. Continuing with this thought process, it's not only the presence of flaws that it's important for breakage, but it's also their propagation rate. Clearly, flaws will propagate faster and therefore break faster under the repeated application of higher external stimuli. Therefore, higher grooming forces associated with this hair type would also be expected to be a contributor. This proclivity for breakage can produce a chain of related events. In an attempt to reduce this occurrence, then minimization of any hair manipulation is desirable, which materializes as a reduced frequency of hair washing. Yet, this can lead to the buildup of sebaceous materials on the scalp, which in, can, in turn can attract microfauna, which in turn can lead to scalp issues. So, in short, size, shape and colour can be used to explain all of these issues. Conversely, at the opposite end of the spectrum, it's seen how fine, thin hair will hang limply from the head, which creates a whole set of other issues for people with this hair type. Returning to some scientific measures, fibre dimensions have a sizable contribution to many of hair's fundamental properties. The graph in this slide shows how the tensile strength of hair, that is the force required to snap an individual strand, is very strongly related to the cross-sectional area, where, not surprisingly, a thicker fibre requires a higher force to break than a thinner one. Nonetheless, this graph shows how a relatively thick 90 micron hair fibre requires around three times more force for breakage than a comparable 50 micron fibre. Fibre dimensions similarly affect the bending and twisting properties of hair fibres. In this slide, I've shown the equations for calculating both the bending and the torsional modulus, or stiffness if you will, for single fibres. Where, in the case of bending, there's a squared relationship to the fibre's cross-sectional area, where in torsion, or twisting, there's a fourth power relationship to the fibre diameter. Therefore, fibres will quickly become stiffer, less easy to bend, and less easy to twist as fibre dimensions increase. And again, we'd expect these properties to be impacting the way that hair moves and the way it interacts with its neighbours. And once again, these differences don't arise because hair is made of different stuff. It's just because, well, there's more stuff present. Another parameter that we should not forget about that has a sizable impact on the perception of a hair is the density of fibres on the scalp. In the past, I participated in marketing and promotional events where we took our scientific equipment out of the lab and measured the properties of hair from event attendees. And during this process, it was relatively common to hear comments such as, oh, I know I have thick hair, only for our laser micrometer measurements to show below average diameters. Or to have the reverse occur where it was believed that hair was thin, but to obtain above average dimensions. The explanation for this, of course, is that even if relatively fine fibres are present, the hair can still feel thick if there's a lot of it on the scalp. And in recent years, there's been considerable interest in the properties of ageing hair, with a number of products appearing on the market that talk to this hair type. Again, there appears no evidence to really suggest any structural changes in hair as we age, outside perhaps of the absence of melanin and grey hair, but clearly fibre density on the scalp does decrease with age, and there is some evidence to suggest some decrease in fibre dimensions. Therefore, again, changing hair properties can be rationalised by somewhat mundane factors. And so to summarize this section, hair comes with vast differences in appearance, properties and behavior, which perhaps seemingly suggests that quite profound differences in the makeup must be present. But I hope I've been able to convince you that that doesn't necessarily need to be the case. 
there's little in the scientific literature to suggest any chemical or structural differences in hair from different sources. And the premise and hopefully the conclusion that you reached from these previous slides uh, has really been to highlight that size, shape and colour alone can be used to rationalise a huge spectrum in diversity. So this likely represents a positively anticlimactic conclusion, uh, but instead now let's delve a little bit further into whether perhaps there is some things which can't be explained in the hair care world by size, shape and colour. In the salon, it's well recognised by stylists that they can take a permanent wave product and use it in exactly the same way on a variety of patrons and get vastly different outcomes. In some cases, they'll get the result they wanted, while in others, the end result is going to be wholly ineffectual. Some people just have resistant hair. And this holds true for other chemical treatments too. In the lab, it's relatively commonplace for us to perform many of our tests on chemically damaged hair, most often bleached hair, as this increases method sensitivity. Yet experienced lab workers recognize that applying a given bleaching procedure to different batches of hair can yield very different results due to this variability in reactivity. So scientists really like to quantify things, and so our attention turns to whether there is a means of investigating these reaction rates. When it comes to perms, at least, well, yes, there is. Um, during the perming process, we attempt to break down internal strength-supporting bonds within the hair with the goal of later reforming them with hair fibers anchored in a new conformation. Therefore, tracking the decrease in the strength of individual fibres as a function of exposure time to a perm solution can act as a proxy for this reaction progression. This idea was first proposed by a recent earring in the 1950s, although it was subsequently popularised in the perm industry by Randy Wickett in the mid to late 1980s, who also coined the phrase single fibre tensile kinetics. The picture on the left shows our experimental setup that consists of a custom built cell which attaches to an Instron tensile tester. Individual hair fibers are anchored at one end by a hook at the base of the cell, while the other is attached to the load cell of, of the instrum. The cell is first filled with water to allow the wet state strength to be characterized, and then the water is quickly drained and replaced by a perm solution, and the clock is started. This slide shows typical results, where the hair is stretched every 30 seconds to a 2% extension to measure the, the strength, so to speak. The graph shows the progressive decrease in the mechanical properties of hair as a function of this exposure time, which can be equated, as we said before, to the progression of the perm solution reacting with the hair. Complex kinetic analyses of this data can be and have been performed, although a quick indication of relative reaction rates can be obtained by evaluating what's called the half time, which is the time required to lower the original strength by 50%. In this graph, the y-axis has been normalized such that the half-time can be evaluated relatively easily. And you can see in this particular case, a half-time of around three and a half minutes is obtained for this specific hair perm combination. This graph now shows half-time data for a common perm solution with hair from the heads of nine different individuals. None of these individuals had performed any kind of chemical treatment on the hair, and so the hair was considered to be virgin in nature. And clearly, very different reaction rates transpire. In particular, the hair from the head of panelist one has a half time that's approximately twice that of panelists seven and eight, implying that reaction rates associated with panelist one and a perm solution is basically twice as slow. This seems to provide a reasonable explanation for the occurrence of resistant hair, where the presence of considerably slower reaction rates would mean considerably less efficacy during a time that the product spends on the hair. Yet this now introduces a new follow-up question of, well, why do these differences in reaction rates occur? A variety of explanations could be theorized, and it's always nice to start with perhaps the simplest ones. And to that end, differences in the ability for hair to swell might be one such simple theory. The origin of this idea lies with the observation that considerably faster SFTK reaction rates arose on chemically damaged hair. And when we think of why that might be, well, chemically damaged hair is widely considered to be more prone to swelling. And so with higher levels of swelling, we might expect faster diffusion rates of chemicals into the hair. Um, granted, this is only a two point correlation, but it at least provides a reasonable hypothesis for further examination. And so our attention turns to measuring the swelling properties of hair. A number of papers can be found in the older scientific literature, say the 1950s, where researchers used microscopes to study hair swelling. But I'm not aware of any newer studies that have been published using today's more modern scientific equipment. 
Here we used a laser micrometer, as shown on the right, which was housed in a benchtop environmental chamber. Experiments were performed on single source hair fibers, and the dark line and the dark data points in the graph show the increase in fiber dimensions as a result of equilibrating fibers at progressively higher humidity, relative to their dimensions at 10% relative humidity, which was the lowest value we could consistently attain with our experimental setup. Results show an approximate 24% increase in cross-sectional area upon progressing from this initial 10% relative humidity state all the way up to totally wet. And because of the squared relationship between the cross-sectional area and the radius, this corresponds to an approximate 11% increase in fiber diameter. The shape of this curve, perhaps not surprisingly, strongly mirrors that of the hair water adsorption isotherm. It's well known that hysteresis exists between the adsorption and desorption hair water isotherms. And to that end, in our swelling experiments, we also observe a hysteresis in fiber dimensions when performing experiments under an increasing or decreasing humidity conditions. In short, if you want thicker hair, let it dry from a wet state. Here I'm now showing historical data from one of those older papers dating back to 1949, which shows an approximate 16% increase in fiber diameter upon going from 0 to 100% relative humidity. So this is a somewhat bigger difference than what we obtained, but they did cover a slightly bigger humidity range. These results are hot off the presses and show the previous swelling curve, which was for single source Asian hair, now compared against single source fine Caucasian hair, where clearly quite substantial differences appear to arise with the fine Caucasian hair undergoing considerably less swelling. Historical papers on resistant hair have suggested that fine hair seems more prone to this condition, although a straightforward one-to-one -one correlation appears too simple and likely would have already been identified if it were true. For now, we continue to perform these swelling experiments to characterize hair from different individuals, with the ultimate goal of then correlating these results to those from the single fiber tensile kinetic technique. Of course, this creates yet another new question, why should hair from different heads swell to different extents? In addressing this question, let me digress for a moment. This picture might appear familiar to those who work with African hair. However, it is in fact a picture of merino wool. There are only two kinky keratin-based fibers in the natural world, merino wool and African hair. And this picture was taken from a 1950 publication by Horio and Kondo, who were looking at the ability for merino wool to take up basic dyes. And what they noticed was that in cross-section, one half of the wool absorbed the dye, they called this dye accessible, or DA, while the other did not, non-DA. Moreover, if they looked down the length of the fibre, it could be seen that this non-dye accessible region always sat on the inside of the curls. And this originated an idea that maybe the shape of keratin fibres was dictated by this differential structure. And in the same edition of the same journal was a similar paper by Mercer, who had noted similar observations, and he had used the phrases orthocortex and paracortex. And it's this naming convention that has stuck, at least until now. Higher magnification microscopic visualization of the hair structure suggested differences in the packing of microfibrils inside the two cortical cells. In paracortical cells, the microfibrils are arranged in a hexagonal packing, which is shown on the right here, while in orthocortical cells, a world structure is observed, as shown on the left. And this later became recognized to be a function of the macrofibrils not aligning parallel to the fiber length, but instead being somewhat inclined. At the same time, there appears to be other differences present between these two cell types. As mentioned, orthocortical cells readily absorb basic dyes, while paracells do not, perhaps in part because orthocells are reported to readily swell in basic solutions, while paracells don't. Similarly, paracells have been reported to be stained by acidic dyes, while orthocells are not, seemingly suggesting that chemical differences are present in addition to these structural ones. Paracortical cells are reported to have a higher cysteine content than orthocells seemingly due to a relatively higher amount of amorphous matrix protein being present. And according to conventional wisdom, this matrix material is the reservoir for water which penetrates and is absorbed by hair. Therefore, in theory at least, hair with a higher paracortex content might be expected to absorb more water and therefore might be expected to swell to higher extents. To make things more interesting, again, a third type of cortical cell was also subsequently reported with intermediate properties to the two already mentioned. These cells possessed similar dye absorption properties to orthocells, but possessed a still more regular hexagonal packing to that of the paracells. 
As a result, this third type of cell became known as mesocortical cells. So this all relates to wool, but well, what about hair? Well, traditionally it had always been believed that hair consisted of paracortical cells, but in 1977, Alan Swift reported that he'd observed a small rim of ortho cells in the outer cortical regions of lightly curled hair. He further observed that very curly African hair showed near equal distributions of these two cell types in a manner similar to that that we've already described for merino wool. No further work in this area appeared to ensue for the next 30 years, until in 2007 workers from L'Oreal Labs in Paris reported that they had found in straight hair a core of paracortical cells with surrounding concentric rings of meso and ortho cells. Meanwhile, it confirmed that African hair consisted of the previously described arrangement. And then in 2009, Bryson and co-workers reported the presence of four cell types, which they termed A through D, abandoning the previous nomenclature, which they believed were arranged in a similar annular manner. So this really is a new and captivating topic that's only now beginning to receive significant attention in the hair field. The concept provides a foundation from which hypotheses about differing internal structure and therefore different hair properties might be rationalized. However, these secrets are not given up easily. Electron microscopy work in this area is hindered by tricky sample preparation and subjective interpretation. A more straightforward measurement approach for probing the internal structure of hair would be nice. Here again I need to go off on a tangent for a few minutes. This is a graph we produced of the Young's modulus of hair, essentially the extensional stiffness as a function of the relative humidity of the surrounding atmosphere. It's well known that water is a plasticizer for hair, and as hair contains more moisture as the relative humidity rises, then so the mechanical properties subsequently decrease. And what I think makes this graph and this method notable is that all measurements were performed on the exact same 50 individual fibers. That is, rather than extending all fibers to break, as is most commonly done, we only extend them to 5% such that the modulus can be evaluated under a specific set of conditions, but with the fibers still remaining now intact. We then equilibrated the hair at 90% relative humidity for a prolonged period to allow this structure to relax, and then we'd set the humidity to a new value, again let it subsequently equilibrate, and then generate data at a new modulus value. And gradually we would build up the graph that you can see here. And if you look closely, you might be able to see that there are three data points at 60% relative humidity. One that was generated at the beginning of the experiment, one in the middle, and one at the end. And these three data points are very comparable and therefore suggest that this methodology is itself not changing the hair properties. The advantage of this approach, even though it is somewhat lengthy to perform, is that we obtain a very low standard deviation as a result of using the exact same fibres throughout. And we have very high confidence in results because we're looking at a trend as opposed to any single data point. So here we're now comparing modulus versus humidity curves for both virgin and chemically damaged or bleached hair, which results in a more complex outcome than what we might have expected. When the relative humidity and therefore the water content is high, the bleached hair has a lower modulus than the virgin hair, as may have been anticipated given that we know that the bleaching process depletes the number of strength supporting bonds within the hair. But under lower humidity conditions, the bleached hair unexpectedly has a higher modulus, which might be contributed to the coarse feel of chemically damaged hair. And so clearly sizable differences in the properties of these two hair types exist under both conditions, but the direction of these changes reverses. Moreover, if by chance a comparison of these two hair types had been performed at 80% relative humidity, we would have been left with the conclusion that there was no difference in this property. As a result, we're learning that evaluation of mechanical properties at any single humidity represents just one snapshot of what could be a much bigger picture. And so we've been performing similar experiments on hair that have been exposed to a variety of different hair insults. After performing a range of these experiments, it seemed conscientious to go back and check the reproducibility of the original curve for virgin hair. And so we performed a comparable set of experiments on another set of 50 fibres procured from a different virgin hair truss, with the results being shown in this slide. At higher water content, maybe from 60-70% relative humidity upwards, the two data sets agreed nicely. But at lower humidity, we consistently obtained a somewhat higher modulus from this second set of experiments. And again, we have confidence in this conclusion as the outcome is consistently obtained across all lower humidity conditions. So again, we're looking at a trend rather than any single data point. 
the mechanical properties of hair are a reflection of the internal structure. And so different mechanical properties in what we believe to be healthy virgin hair would seem to apply differences in this internal structure. In following up this hypothesis, it was necessary to perform additional experiments on further hair sources. Yet the hair tresses that we purchase from the hair supplier companies, and therefore the hair that we used in all of our work to date, all consist of blended hair, made up of strands from a variety of donors. In short, our results constituted an average across a spectrum of individuals. And for this reason, all further experiments have been performed on single source hair. I had some hair in the lab that had been donated by a past intern who had cut off a considerable length of her hair during her time with us in going to a shorter style. And here I'm showing results from this third set of experiments using the intern's hair, which show very comparable results to the second set. Continuing further, I was able to persuade one of my technicians to part with a small number of her hair fibers, and we performed a fourth set of experiments. These data points are represented by the yellow circles in this slide, and it's seen that experiments two, three, and four all essentially fall on a common curve. So, so at this point, I began wondering if perhaps something had gone wrong with the first set of experiments, which appeared to be coming somewhat of an outlier. That was at least until I performed a fifth set of experiments on commercially supplied mixed race hair, which produced a modulus versus relative humidity curve that was higher again than that for experiments two, three, and four. More work is clearly needed in this area, but it appears that we are indeed measuring subtle differences in the mechanical properties of hair from different sources. This difference best manifests when performing experiments under low humidity conditions, presumably where the plasticizing effects of water are minimized. We recognise that others have sought such presumed differences in the past without success, yet most often tensile testing is performed in a wet state, or if it is performed in a dry state, it's generally at a 50 or 60 percent relative humidity. It seems that testing under low relative humidity conditions is optimum for spotting such differences. In addition, the industry's traditional use of blended hair in many of the tests we perform may also have contributed to masking this observation until now. So let's change gear now and start thinking about how to describe hair of different appearance. As mentioned earlier, historically hair typing had generally been equated with ethnicity, but in the mid to late 2000s, workers from L'Oreal introduced a classification system with the specific objective of being independent of geographic origin. This system was based on hair shape, and researchers initially used three approaches to characterize the shape of hair obtained from a very large number of donors. The first involved a curl diameter meter, an approach that is, has its origins in the forensic area, and that puts a numerical value on the tightness of curls. The second was a curl ratio approach, which looks at the natural length of the fibres relative to their extended length. While a third involved two related approaches that looked at the number of waves and the number of twists and kinks in fibres of a specific length. Having collected all of this data, a statistical analysis was performed, which grouped hair into eight different categories based on this shape. And these are shown here in terms of two segmentation trees, which I've taken from two different publications of this work in the scientific literature. The first four groups are defined solely on the curl diameter measurements, with type one having a curl diameter greater than around about 10 to 11, type two being somewhere between six and 11, type three being between three and six, and type four being between one and three. If the curl diameter is lower than this, then further classification makes use of the other two parameters. A curl diameter of less than one in combination with a curl index of less than six and fewer than three to four curls in a specific length constitutes type five, while the same curl diameter and curl index in combination with more than three to four curls dictates type six. Similarly, a curl index greater than six with five or fewer waves equates to type seven, while well, more than six waves equates to type eight. So this can be a useful system for describing the curly appearance of hair. For example, it's become fairly common to hear or see statements similar to uh, experiments were performed on curly or kinky hair that equates to a five or six on the L'Oreal scale. But of course, a classification system based on curvature and curliness produces a system for describing curly hair, which is, of course, just one of a great number of hair's properties. For example, in this slide, I show pictures of individuals with fine blonde Caucasian hair and thick, heavily pigmented Asian hair, both of which will be termed type 1 based on the classification system just described. 
although clearly the properties of these two hair types would be hugely different. For this reason, I propose expanding the L'Oreal system by adding other descriptors. For example, a term could be added to describe the thickness of hair. And here I've suggested using the descriptors F, M and T as symbols for fine, medium and thick. And I've also given some approximate ranges for these descriptors, which are open to debate, but which I think are at least a decent starting point. A designation could also be added to describe the colour of hair. Rather than making up any new term for colour, I simply propose using the L value from a standard LAB colour measurement. As a review, the CIE LAB approach describes colour in three-dimensional space as a result of its lightness, L, its redness-greenness, A, and its blueness-yellowness, B, with each of these axes having units from 0 to 100. And so with regard to the L axis, 100 is the lightest and 0 is the darkest. And for aesthetic purposes, I suggest adding this second numerical term as a subscript. And so by this extended approach, for the two hair types shown earlier, the straight fine blonde hair shown on the left could have the descriptor 1F80, 1 indicating the straightness, F designating its fine dimensions, and 80 describing its lightness, while conversely the hair on the right would be described as 1T25, 1 again describing its straightness, T indicating thick hair fibres, and 20 representing very low lightness. And so to further emphasise this point by showing a few other examples and returning to some pictures I used previously, again straight, thick, heavily pigmented Asian hair might have the descriptor 1T25. The curly, darkish blonde Caucasian hair shown here might be 3M50, while the very curly, heavily pigmented African hair might be 7M20. So while I'd like to think that this is a nice step forward in scientifically describing hair, I think it's still missing one of the critical parameter. And that is an indication of the hair's damage level. Damage is the great leveller for all of the discussions we've had to this point. With all of our new scientific equipment and methods, we can hunt for smaller and smaller potential differences in hair structure and properties as a function of hair type. But with this said, very easily seen and eminently measurable differences are readily obtained as a result of the various hair insults which cumulatively produce what we describe in one all-encompassing word, damage. Clearly, even if there are subtle differences in the properties of hair from different people, they will be completely washed out, if you pardon the pun, if the surface of the hair changes from that seen on the left to that on the right, as a result of all the things that we do to hair. Clearly, degradation of the cuticle will have dramatic effects on tactile properties, on manageability, shine, and potentially many other properties. Similarly, even if there are subtle differences in the modulus of hair from different individuals, as we've already shown, insults such as chemical treatments, heat treatments, and even exposure to the sun's rays can all produce differences comparable to or even greater than any small innate differences that might be present. Industry folklore suggests that around 70% of all women utilise some kind of chemical treatment – bleaching, highlights, colour, perms, relaxers. Add in those the heat style and the numbers are even higher again. So even if there were differences in the swellability of hair from different people after performing any of these treatments, swelling levels would be expected to rise and perhaps swamp out inherent differences. And so to sum up, unquestionably hair from the heads of different individuals can possess hugely different properties that dictate very different habits and practices, which might provide the impression that different structures could be present. However, perhaps anticlimactically, there's little evidence for any such differences. And about the only thing that stands out is that hair comes in different sizes, shapes and colours. Yet I hope I was able to demonstrate how such mundane properties can nevertheless have huge impact on hair properties, which can be used to rationalise many of the issues that consumers reference. An exception to this thesis appears to be the differing reactivity of different hair sources with a common chemical treatment, which leads to the whole concept of resistant hair. Nonetheless, this size, shape, colour premise does indeed illustrate why different products are indeed necessary for different hair types. For example, those with long, thick, curly hair need all the help they can get in detangling and grooming, which dictates the need for heavy, strong conditioning treatments. This benefit might be desirable to those with finer, thin hair also, yet the heavy conditioning deposits will weigh down the hair, killing what consumers tend to call body and volume. So this sets up a conditioning volume trade-off curve where maximizing one tends to decrease the other. 
And so product manufacturers usually produce a range of conditioner variants under a given brand with a spectrum of conditioning performance that sits on different points of this curve. Heavy intensive moisturizing conditioners provide optimum conditioning that's intended for those with thick curly hair. And here the weight of the product on the hair might even be beneficial in taming frizz and curbing volume. Alternatively, lighter so-called body-fine conditioners are more appropriate for those with fine thin hair, while perhaps a normal hair variant sits near the midpoint. Of course, habits and practices might be induced based on size, shape and colour, which can then further change hair properties and impact product choice and needs. For example, those with long, thick, curly hair might be heavy heat stylers in an attempt to create smoother, straighter looks. And this will lead to the hair becoming progressively more damaged and fragile, which then necessitates additional care. Similarly, those with fine, thin hair might indulge in practices such as backcombing or maybe perming in an attempt to build body and volume, which again results in a degree of damage and subsequently necessitates maintenance strategies. And so in short, maybe one day we will discover that small differences in structure or chemical makeup exist in different hair types, which take us above and beyond the realm of size, shape and colour. But nonetheless, even then, the things that we do to our hair would seem to have a hugely greater impact than any such small innate difference. And so there's still a deficiency in our proposed extended classification system for hair in that this system contains no indication of hair's relative health or damage level. By means of illustration, the two pictures in this slide both show straight, fine, blonde, Caucasian hair, but one appears to be natural while the other is obviously bleached. And so while looking similar, we would still expect quite different hair properties and therefore quite different product needs. But adding a means for characterizing damage to this designation is not a trivial task, as damage can arise in different parts of the hair, perhaps the cuticle, perhaps the internal cortex, and can be induced by different means, for example, chemical damage, mechanical damage, photochemical damage, or maybe even heat damage. And to that end, I guess it's always a good idea to wrap up a presentation by showing that more research is needed. And so with that, all that remains is to thank you for your attention in viewing this video. If you have any questions, any comments, I would love to hear from you. My contact details are given at the end of this slide. Uh, so once again, this is Trevor Evans and thanks again for listening.